Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a show a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Jor Law on the line, and he's co-founder of verifyinvestor.com. Jor, welcome to the show. Adam, thank you for having me on. All right, George. So uh, today's topic is a big one. This is a hot topic. A lot of executives, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, that watch this and, you know, raising capital and different sources and ways to raise capital is always a hot topic on the show. So excited to get into uh, crowdfunding and some of the things that you've been able to accomplish in that space. Um, But before we do, uh, I'd like to start this episode the way that we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, Jor, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Jor, what mission matters to you? Oh, I think it's I think it's a couple of missions. Um, and you know, some of them are more business missions and some of them are more personal missions. You know, obviously at Verify Investor, I think the mission um is you know safe accreditations, you know, to the extent that the law is forcing us to do uh, verification of credit investors, how can we do that safely in a manner that is uh, economical and also protects the investors, right? As an investor myself, I really want to make sure that my information is uh, being safely applied, viewed at, and stored, and things like that. Um, from a personal perspective, I think I have I have a few things. I, I have a personal mission of that's maybe a little bit uh, contradictory to the Verify Investor mission in the sense that I want to expand a credit investor pie. I want to expand access to investment opportunities to a greater uh, swath of the population. Instead of making this fine line between, hey, the credit investors can invest and then the non-accredited investors can't, I really want to find a way that uh, everyone can invest yet still be protected. Um, you know, uh, other than that, you know, uh, on a business end, uh, I also am uh, passionate about the tokenization of finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is the idea of using uh, decentralized technologies and, or cryptocurrency type of technologies um, mm-hmm. to kind of impact finance. Uh, so I'm passionate about that. Um, and finally, from a personal perspective, I think uh, I'm always very interested in financial literacy and entrepreneurship mm-hmm. because I think education in those two areas is missing from the uh, American education system. And those are sort of the, those are some of the things that are impacting kind of uh, the way legislation has to be done because you know, there's this need, there's this feeling that um, lawmakers feel that they need to protect certain types of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But if they just properly educated them in the first place, they wouldn't need those protections because some of those protections actually take away some of their rights as well. Mm -hmm. No, it's great having you on the show, Jor, because I I think of you as kind of, as I was looking at your background and I was also looking at, um, you know, some of the the ventures that you're involved in now, which we'll, we'll discuss some of those coming up. But uh, the way I see it is that you're really trying to, you know, democratize investing on one side, but then you're also an advocate of entrepreneurs. So I, I love it. And that's one of the great reasons why we uh, why we brought you on the show is that um, you're at being an advocate for entrepreneurs and investors. It, it's good. Uh, and, and it's definitely a mission based and mission aligned with us. So uh, excited to have you here. Um, I think maybe let's start this conversation um, maybe a little bit further back. So like, when did you get this? And I don't know if you have it like this entrepreneurial bug or this like want to start businesses. Like when did all that start for you? Oh, I, I think it's always uh, been the case. My my family is very entrepreneurial. My brother is entrepreneurial. My parents are entrepreneurial. My grandfather was entrepreneurial. Um, so it's in the I, genes, huh? <laughs> I, I think it's in genes. You know, probably the the first thing that I remember was I think somewhere maybe either I think between third and fourth grade, maybe my parents enrolled me in um, in summer camp at school. And one of the th- uh, things was that everyone would create their own little business. And, you know, I, you know, so most people did, you know, little, you know, things that they would make and then sell. Right. So the yeah. teacher would generate fake money and things like that. And we'd have an economy. Um, I, you know, I, I did lottery tickets. <laughs> um, so, you know, lottery tickets for, you know, third graders is very enticing. So yeah. I think by the end of the summer, I, I pretty much had bought out almost all the other businesses, if not all of them. Um, and that was probably my first entrepreneurial kind of venture, which was just by accident, you know, um, because I happened to pick a product that is addictive, right? Yeah. Um, and, and kids aren't equipped to do that. So, so it was out of ignorance that I, I did that. But 
from there, I went on to sell candy, you know, and things like that. Um, so all my life, I've been somewhat entrepreneurial. Man, that's awesome. And uh, you cornered the market on lottery tickets. That's amazing in third grade. Come on, man. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, um, you know, going a little bit further into your career. So, of course, you know, you start it's in your genes, like to start businesses, do things like that. Like, when did it when did it get serious for you? And you kind of knew you're like, okay, like, this is definitely the path I'm I'm taking. Like, when did entrepreneurship get serious for you? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, my family is all business folks, and they Mm -hmm. they weren't exactly the fondest of lawyers. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, so I always thought actually I grew up to be a businessman, hmm. um, but I really was curious about law. So I was wondering like, Hey, you know, why, why are we like not so fond of lawyers? Um, you know, I want to go learn what the lawyers know and then bring that back hmm. into the business. It turns out that I really enjoyed law and, you know, sometimes you go down one path, you kind of get stuck in that path. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but the law is actually quite interesting. So I did law for uh, a number of years. Mm-hmm. And when I came out to have my own law firm, I wanted to try to uh, break into kind of start up uh, the legal practice. Basically, I had pretty much done legal representation of larger companies, et cetera. But I was really interested in, in the venture capital space and I wanted to get into that space. So one of the things I did is my philosophy is to really, really understand the client. If you really, really understand the client, I think you can really deliver uh, better legal services or any other service, right, to, to know your mm-hmm. customer. And that's missing from a lot of law firms, I think. So one of the ways I did that was I started taking some of my own capital and I started investing in startups mm-hmm. to kind of be in the game, to be on that side as well. Mm-hmm. And because I didn't really have very much capital, I was very paranoid. So I'd like I'd be one of those investors that like hung around, like, what's going <laughs> on, what's going on? Oh, you're having pro- trouble? How can I help? So I keep trying to help. And over a period of time, I think I got very comfortable with mm-hmm how to launch a business, how, how business operates and things like that. So when the crowdfunding laws came down, everyone was focused on kind of the, the technical crowdfunding. And from my perspective, I just, from my background in business, my background in law, I just thought, wait, that's not very practical. Like it's this mm-hmm. other part of crowdfunding. It's just, it's just other part of the law that no one's talking about that's actually gonna be the one that people use. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wanted a product there. I looked around. As some of the other people doing um, you know, things in that space, and I just thought, eh, you know what, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with them. I don't know who they are. They're not backed by lawyers. Uh, they look like they're startups that are like really just trying to make it big, you know, sell data and and then exit. And then, and I knew it had to be a professional um, approach, you know, based on privacy mm-hmm. and, and integrity. Um, and since I had worked with so many startups already, I just, thought, you know what, I'll just, I'll just do it myself. Caught up some friends. Um, you grab the uh, dev team and we launched a few months later. Wow. What an amazing story. And uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of professionals out there. Let's just say lawyers, doctors, a lot of, a lot of very, you know, highly educated individuals. Let's, let's say have, maybe even have some resources, contacts, connections, and they have an idea and they have a concept that they want to go to market. Now, obviously I'm not, I mean, infinite possibilities there. So um, there's lots of ways to do that. But I guess what I'm looking for from you is what do you think was the difference there? That defi- that that thing that made you go from just having the idea to actually doing it? Because I feel like so many people are stuck in that kind of like, ah, that having the idea, but they don't ever actually do it. Like, what do you think was kind of that difference? I think for me, I saw it as um, a real, relatively uh, risk-free endeavor mm-hmm. and it would help my uh, existing practice already. So I mm-hmm. kind of ran through some numbers and I thought, just on the basis that my law firm can do more business, mm-hmm. I will already make X dollars, right? So, you know, in my mind, it was like, it will cost me X dollars to launch this business. If I yeah. never get a client, but I just use my law firm and direct my clients to that um, mm-hmm. so that I could deliver more legal services, uh, mm-hmm. then at least I'll break even, right? So, so that was my mentality and therefore it was relatively risk-free, right? Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, the other part of it was that um, this was an area of law I wanted to practice in, mm-hmm. and I didn't have a great place to refer clients to do it. And therefore, if I couldn't kind of sign off on like, hey, do it this way, then I'd never even get the legal work because I'd, I'd say mm-hmm. like, there's no good way to do it, right? So yeah. I think that was what it was. It wasn't like I woke up and I thought like, I can do this. I'm going to be great. I woke up and I said, okay, how do I protect my revenue at the law firm? And that's how I built it. And it just accidentally mm-hmm. turned into more. 
I love I love ask, asking this question and, and understanding like what the thought process was behind because I feel like there's some people that'll watch this that are in a, in a similar position, not necessarily the same niche, not even necessarily the same industry, but it might be a doctor or some other under industry to where they're like, oh, there's some things maybe in my niche or that I don't have to that are that I don't have to really take a lot of risk on that are going to feed my current um, practice or business. It's just a different angle and way to explore entrepreneurship in general. It's not saying you have to, you know you know, quit everything you're doing or anything of that nature and, and, and roll, roll the dice and say that this is going to be the one or the big venture. There's also, you know, there's something to be said for creating a complementary product that feeds your current revenue streams, your current expertise, and that doesn't cause you to have to take a lot of risks. So love the story, Jar. Um, yeah. So um, I want to, you mentioned crowdfunding. So I want to maybe spend some more time on this side of things. So um, when it comes to crowdfunding, there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's a lot of different ways to, I guess, a lot of different uses for the capital. So when we think about how startups should be thinking, and of course, it's going to be different for every startup, but like, what are some of the things they should be considering when thinking about going the crowdfunding route for either expansion or just funding the business? Yeah, you know, I I think it's, it's one of those things where they have to think, you know, why, why would I crowdfund? What are the benefits of, of crowdfunding and what are the detriments, right? So, so they should really understand, do I want to be out there publicly? Do I want that public attention? Um, and, you know, what are, what are the requirements for me to have that public uh, attention? Mm -hmm. um, what do I have to observe? You know, what limitations do I have? And what are my alternatives, right? So for a lot of people, they might get, you know, the, the traditional ways of raising money. They might not have access to those, right? And they have no choice. They'll have to crowdfund. Or in some cases, uh, their product is such that crowdfunding does a dual pur purpose. It might raise money and it might also, you know, uh, get them some clients and things yeah. like that. So let, let's people, build that out just for a second. I don't want to pass that yet. So the traditional ways sure. of, of raising money, like, you know, venture capital, like maybe name a couple of those. You know, venture capital, certainly for some people, but sure. you know, most people don't, uh, you know, access venture capital and venture capital as a funding source in, in uh, our ecosystem isn't really the largest funding source. Right. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people go out and raise money. You know, people say they get it from like three Fs, right. The friends, families, and the fools yeah. that will believe them, but right? the <laughs> people that are close to them, um, that will kind of say like, I will give you a chance because I care about you. Some of them may not even believe in it, but they just want to support them. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of times it's people that support, uh, that believe in you and say like, wow, you have a passion for this. I know you can do this here. You know, I will trust you because I know you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, private networks, you know, if you have the ability to banks and, you know, to get loans, a lot of people use credit cards, right. They're there, mm -hmm. you know, they're easy to use. They're expensive, but they're there. Right. Um, some people will write grants um, in, uh, just to get uh, grant money for some of the things that they're doing. Some of them are, you know, um, will work with their vendors and you know, start kind of, you know, buying some, you know, equipment, et cetera. Um, but, you know, you know, on payment mm -hmm. terms, so their vendors will invest in them or some vendors see the potential in a business generating a lot of revenues for them in the future. They might kind of, you know, be those initial investors. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of, of every, everything. And that's really good. If you have that network, right, it's really good if you can go to your uncle and your cousin and your mom and dad and say, hey, you know, I'm starting this. Can you help me out? But what if, you know, that's not your um, your background, right? What if you're not privileged like that? Or like, what if you go to a bank and they look at you and say, like, you know, they always say banks will give you money when you don't need it. Right. Yeah. So when you need it and they don't give it to you. And then when you don't need it, then they, you know, then they're like, hey, take our money. Right. So some <laughs> people don't have access to that. And for mm -hmm. some of those people, something like crowdfunding might be a better option. Mm. And then I maybe um, actually just to go a little bit further there, I don't want to assume everybody I knew. I know we all hear the term like crowdfunding and it's a buzzword. And maybe for those that haven't explored it, you know, further, like maybe just a broad overview of the, the, the crowdfunding landscape and what that yeah. means. Yeah. So unfortunately, this is an area that's fairly confusing um, mm -hmm. because there is a legal term crowdfunding, which was kind of attributed to something called Regulation CF. And, and that's the one where technically it's crowdfunding. And when they say legally crowdfunding, they're talking about, um, you know, like a, a raise up to $5 million. Originally, it was just $1 million. So it's very impractical. Mm -hmm. But now it's a raise up to $5 million. Um, and it's, uh, you know, usually for investment securities and things like that, mm -hmm. right? That's what the, technically is crowdfunding. 
that's not how people like you and me and, and normal yeah. people think of crowdfunding, right? We think of crowdfunding, or at least I think of crowdfunding as I'm um, funding from the crowd, from yeah. people that I don't know, from like the masses, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note that funding from the crowd doesn't mean it has to be everybody. Like sometimes people are like, oh, crowdfunding. It's not crowdfunding if it's not everybody. But that's not true, right? You can crowdfund from a specific geographic region, from a specific demographic, et cetera, et cetera, and it's still crowdfunding. So for me, crowdfunding is just funding from masses and the crowd that of, of people that are not in your private network that you don't know. So when you look at crowdfunding like that, then it, then the door opens up a little bit, right? Um, then things like Regulation A uh, allows you to raise capital again from you know non-accredited investors as well, and then the things like Rule Five Hundred Six C and of Regulation D allow you to generally solicit and, and advertise, which you used to not be able to do for investment mm -hmm. securities. And then also the purest form of crowdfunding that you know a lot of people knew before that there were these investment crowdfunding laws um, out there are things like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. That's crowdfunding too, right? It's just not it's just not investment crowdfunding. It's more, you know, I'm pre-selling my product type of crowdfunding. Yeah, I feel like most people when they have had experience with crowdfunding, again, it's through things like you said, the Kickstarters of the world, because that that's what gets the media. But they, as you mentioned, they haven't necessarily looked at the investing side. Um, one other term I think that it's important to uh, to define before we maybe get further into the conversation, uh, just to make sure everybody understands it. And a moment, especially when we get into verifyinvestor.com, we'll go further into it. But maybe just kind of broad overview of what an accredited investor is. Got it. So the accredited investor is this term um, that effectively uh, defines uh, a type of investor that mm -hmm. people believe have a level of wealth and or sophistication mm -hmm. uh, whereby they don't need as much protection from the laws. Right. Yeah. So people figure like, hey, they're big boys. They can go lose their money or yeah. they're rich enough. They can go lose their money. Um, so. If you divide it out, if there's kind of like the individual's basket and then there's the entity's basket. So from an individual's perspective, for the longest time, it was tied to uh, your income or your net worth. So if you had income of like 200000 by yourself or with your together with your spouse or significant other, um, spousal equivalent, actually not significant other, spousal equivalent, uh, then it would be two hundred or uh, 300000 right, if you had a spousal equivalent. Um, or you'd have a net worth, minimum net worth of a million dollars, kind of excluding your primary residence, right? Mm -hmm. um, very recently, they added this sophistication um, criteria, which was like if you held certain licenses, uh, then you would automatically be accredited. And, and that was a little bit in response to the idea that people would say that, hey, just because this person has money doesn't mean they can, you know, make good investment decisions. And then yeah. some other people saying, well, how can this kid here? or just investment professional be advising on other people on how to invest their money when they can't even invest themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So so it was the idea recently was that they added this kind of sophistication um, test on there, but it's, you know, not too many people would qualify for it because they tied it to a, um, a specific license that's not the easiest to get. Uh, from mm -hmm. an entity side, some entities are accredited just because of the type of entity they are. Like they're a bank, they're an insurance company, they're just automatically accredited, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, most other ones will just qualify because they got $5 million in assets mm -hmm. and they weren't formed for the purpose of that making that one investment. But basically $5 million of assets test or because every owner of that company was an accredited investor. It, you know, Obviously, mm -hmm. if you and I are accredited investors and we form a company, that company probably should be an accredited investor, right? So that's where mm -hmm. that logic comes in. No, that's right. That's very helpful. Um, okay, great. So now going further into the conversation, I just want to get some of those terms out as we kind of, you know, dig deeper. So now getting circling back to the question that I asked originally. So when someone, when a startup is thinking about uh, expansion or they're thinking about, you know, how to raise capital, like what are, what are some of the things that, as you, you mentioned already, maybe they don't have access to some of the other traditional, um, the traditional lines of, 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 um, of raising capital, which you already mentioned. So now what are some of the things that make the crowdfunding side of things a potential, a potentially um, attractive thing for, for businesses out there? The, the biggest thing is that if you don't have your network, if there's not like 
if there's not a, an identifiable person that you can go to or group of people that you can go to okay. and say, hi, my name is Jor, I'm doing this, I'd love to go raise some money. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't get yourself on Shark Tank or things like that, right? Things like that, yeah. right? Then you have nowhere else to go. But mm -hmm. if you can crowdfund, all you need is a marketing message, right? Mm -hmm. If you can tweet, if you can create an advertisement on Facebook or LinkedIn or anything, mm -hmm. if you can create some publicly facing message, and mm -hmm. sometimes you could do that for free, right? Mm -hmm. Like that Twitter, people, like you just said, yeah. Right? Yeah, that people resonate with, then they could be your potential investors, right? So you open up, theoretically, the whole world to your um, investment offering. Because a, a lot of times, you know, when I say hope theoretically, because, you know, laws might restrict this and that, but mm -hmm. a lot of it is just access. You don't, if you don't have access to investors, mm -hmm. you won't get money. So if you can generally solicit and advertise to find investors, at least you have a chance to find somebody that might give you money. Yeah, I think access change, this changes the game, doesn't it? Like access changes the game. Yes. Wow. Yes, um, from, your, from your vantage point, like what are some of the things that you've seen maybe, um, and you don't have to give a name or anything like that, but just, and if you want to, you can, but what are some of the things that you, you've seen startups or businesses successfully raise um, um, or some of the ways that you've seen successful businesses or startups raise crowdfunding? Like any, it could be a campaign, it could be other things like that, but what are some of the things that you've noticed have made certain individuals um, successful? Um, you know, it's an existing company mm -hmm. leveraging their existing client base or customer base mm. is always pretty good. So, you know, some, some, some restaurants, for example, will just put up a sign and say, want to, you know, be an owner in our next mm. location. Um, but there is one, uh, real estate senior home, home senior home development it, and they were, doing a new development in a uh, town that apparently the whole population felt that there was a lack of senior homes. Mm. So they took ads on the side of buses and that's all they needed. People would look at really? it really more in this thing. And then they started getting investments. Right. Um, so those sort of things, you know, for uh, some of the mobile apps that have some users, they, they might throw in the advertisement right onto their ad saying like, Hey, you know, we're doing crowdfunding. If you're interested in owning part of this app, you know, contact us. Right. So, wow. they, so anytime you can leverage your existing client base, uh, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. If you don't have your uh, existing client base, you know, some, some people do it themselves to start trying to build uh, their own um, audience. And, and you find this to be true in cryptocurrency, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of crypto um, currencies or uh, companies in the blockchain space that are raising money. Um, a lot of them will start trying to develop that community, start showing traction, start building those fans, and then kind of telling them, hey, there's this, you know, investment um, opportunity mm -hmm. coming down the pipeline. Um, uh, so, you know, in some people will hire PR firms uh, mm -hmm. or marketing firms that are, you know, particularly good at, you know, crowdfunding. They kind of understand how to market toward you know, investors. And so, for example, let's just say, so let's just say here at Mission Matters, we want to we want to launch a new show or something else. And we know what the production budget's going to be. We know all these other things. And we're like, you know, let's go to our audience. This is going to be a new piece of IP. And let's see if the audience to help fund this show. That That's an idea. Not saying we're doing that, by the right. way. But like just trying to like give some ideas or shake, you know, shake the right. cobwebs from some of our entrepreneurs that are watching this on how they can possibly use it. That, yeah, perfect. You know, it, it's one of those things. If, if you wanted to go raise money in your startup, you'd go to your friends and you'd say, hey, Jor, you know, um, I'm expanding this, you know, give me some money. You know, it's going to be great. Or if you don't or if you are in the right industry with the right connections, you might be able to go to a venture capitalist and say, hey, you know, uh, this show is, you know, um, has this type of trajectory. We're going to hockey stick like this. Uh, this is what you look for. Mm. Uh, if you're the terms, will you invest in me, right? Or you go to a bank if you can and say, hey, you know, I've got good credit, give me some loan. But if you have a hundred thousand viewers, if you got a million dollar, million subscribers, etc., instead of going to like those 50 people that are your entire private network and hoping mm. that they believe in you and have the money and are interested in what you're doing and giving you money, 
you could potentially reach a hundred thousand people or a million people, mm. whatever your kind of viewership is, mm. just by saying, "Hey, we're crowdfunding. If you're interested, let me know." And now you're getting your your available capital just you know balloon. Ah, it's a great idea. I love it. And I, like I said, uh, like you said earlier, and uh, and I agree with providing access to capital for new ideas or even for expansion or other things for businesses, complete game changer. I think it's amazing. Um, and it's going to get provide a lot of opportunity jobs. I mean, just the potential effect. I mean, it's, it's a good thing, in my opinion. Um, so switching, um, switching gears slightly here, I do want to spend some time as well talking about verifyinvestor.com. So, um, you mentioned earlier in the, in the program, you mentioned that, you know, this was kind of a, originally an extension of maybe your law firm, a way to get into the space and a way to help out and provide more value. Um, tell us where it's at today. Like, tell us about, about the actual, um, site and, and, uh, product. Yeah, so so the product um, is shockingly close to kind of what we launched as because the laws haven't changed very much, right? So um, if you think about what our product really is, is it's a combination of, I, I guess the easier, e- easiest way to uh, describe it would be like Uber for accredited investor verification, right? <laughs> so basically, companies that wanted to verify investors to make sure that they're actually accredited investors or investors that wanted to certify that they are accredited investors so that they could tell companies that they are accredited investors mm-hmm. have to go through this process whereby they somebody's looking at their you know tax returns, their bank mm-hmm. statements, their credit report, and things like that. You know, I don't know about you, but if a company is trying to raise money from me, I don't particularly want to give my entire network. No way. No, um, I don't want to do that. that. Particular company. Maybe someone else, but not that company, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and also, if I'm a company, right now I'm going to collect all this information. I don't want to collect that information. Actually. I don't want to do that either. Yeah. I mean, some other companies might, but, you know, I, I don't want that liability. I don't want that responsibility mm-hmm. um, and, and hassle. And if I get it wrong, mm-hmm. right, the law is such that you have to reasonably verify. But if you even, if so if you, don't reasonably verify even one person, like even your mom, you know, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Then your entire offering could be illegal, right? It's, it's, wow. The risk is not the risk is not worth it, right? So, no. so the idea is, so what we are effectively is we created software that effectively is almost like an Uber for uh, verifications. Mm-hmm. So on one side, somebody can come and say, hey, uh, this is who I am. I'm going to upload information. Or from a company's perspective, they can say, hey. You know, please contact Adam. He would like to get verified, and we'll shoot you an email. And then you can go through our our, our um, kind of software. And the software is like a wizard that says, "Hey, you know, what's your name? Who are you trying to verify? Mm-hmm. You know, what? Here are the ways that you could verify. Which one kind of do you think you fit into? You click on what you think you fit into. Then it kind of says, "Okay, well, to prove that, you would have to upload this sort of information. Mm-hmm. So you upload it, you know, um, and then you submit it." And when mm-hmm. you submit it, it goes into this reviewing pool. And then the other side happens whereby, uh, you know, reviewing attorneys, in our case, we only use third party uh, attorneys to conduct these reviews uh, for professional reasons and, and attorney mm-hmm. client privilege re- reasons and things like that. Um, they get notification that there's uh, verifications. Mm-hmm. So they actually come on to the system, claim the verification, conduct the review, mm-hmm. and then decide is this person accredited or not. Or do I need more information, right? Mm-hmm. So what we've effectively done is a software that kind of uh, streamlines the uh, data collection process and adds in security and you know, confidentiality in it. And and I can give you an example if you'd like about like Please. how it's different. Okay, so if you were going to go to a law firm, mm-hmm. you know, normally you'd go to a law firm, you tell them what you want to do. So now you got to schedule a phone call, tell them what you want to do. And they hop on a phone call, they explain, you know, you tell them what you need. They say, okay, that's great. They get off the phone. They've got to send an engagement letter over to you, take an hour or two, et cetera. Yeah. Um, probably their assistant's doing it. Sends the engagement letter to you. You sign it. You send it back. Then it's a series of phone calls or emails to explain, okay, well, this is what it is. How do you qualify? Do you qualify this way? Okay, well, send me this. And then it's back and forth, back and forth. It's a lot of time right here, Jor. This is a lot of time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be okay if you weren't charged for that time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but lawyers charge by the hour, you know, or by the minute. And so what happens is that entire process is actually um, pretty 
time intensive and therefore mm -hmm. uh, cost uh, intensive. Uh, and also, when you're sending information, you're probably sending it through email, insecure email. Mm -hmm. It's probably, you know, the, the lawyer might forward it to their assistant to mm -hmm. print it out. It might get printed out on a shared printer mm -hmm. and be sitting in there you know, on a shared printer for, you know, 15 minutes, an hour, even a day. Mm -hmm. And then it gets dropped off maybe onto the lawyer's desk, probably in an unlocked office, maybe overnight. Then the lawyer sits down and conducts a review. It takes like a minute, two, three, maybe, right? Yeah. In most cases, right? They're like, okay, well, income, yep, 200000 Other W-2, oh, 200000 done, right? Mm -hmm. That's how fast the review actually takes, the, the actual lawyer time, right? And then, okay, they say, that's great. Type out a letter, sign it, take the, those document client files, put it into the file cabinet, which is probably an unlocked file cabinet in another mm -hmm. room, right? There's just so many security leaks. It's it's not very private, and it takes a long time, and it's expensive. And then we basically streamline that so that the most expensive part in that entire process is the lawyer. The lawyer is spending, you know, just the time that they need to. And everything mm -hmm. around that is software guidance. If they've got general questions, we have um, we have a support line that they can email. We don't give legal advice because uh, we're not a law firm, but we can say like, hey, you know, this is a definition that's here, this is what the lawyers you know, have told us that they would accept. We can walk through a lot of the uh, data collection. And for and from a safety perspective, when investors upload information, they can choose to redact it. We're, I think we're the only uh, company out there that lets them kind of do online redaction. And once they submit it, even the investor cannot view their own documents, right? Like, so even if they gave their password out on, on a napkin to somebody and someone logged in, no one would be able to actually look at those documents because it, it they'd be locked even from their investor's own account. So so we we built a lot of things like that to streamline the process and make it faster and safer. Man, Jor, that that was a genius idea. Um, how many uh as, as I'm looking to the original like way that you made you 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 came up with the idea, how it complemented the practice and also the value you're adding in terms of for the not only for the for the lawyers, now you've also obviously provided opportunity and an amazing funnel to where they get to do what they want to do, right? Um, like the good uh, reviewing the documents and doing all of the higher level thinking things that the that the profession requires versus maybe some of the other things in between, right? So right. um um, on both sides of the coin, you have a win because now the accredited investors too, um, you know, they they have a better user experience, and then they're more likely to um, also for the for the startups out there, um, they're more likely to go through those processes, especially the first time accredited investor who's like, ah, I don't want to go through all this. I, I would like to, but. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to give them all my documents or do this or do that or have to deal with my lawyer and all these other things. Now it's just you just made it so simple. It sounds to me like the the pool of potential invest of accredited investors that maybe would invest is also kind of expanded through this process. You just made it accessible. Yeah, you know, the, I, I will say that the first year we got a lot of angry emails. Uh, we got scolded a lot. You know, why are you doing this? I can go into a casino and gamble and no one checks and, or I've been doing this for X number of years. No one's ever had to verify. Like people were, a lot of people didn't know there was like kind of a new law that required verification. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people thought that like we're offended. You, you get a lot of people that are uh, offended because, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have to prove them who they are. Mm -hmm. um, you also get some other people that like are very like happy to show it. Like, you know, we, our software will tell you, for example, if you're qualifying off net worth, if you cross the million dollars threshold, we tell you like, hey, that's it. You don't need to give us any more information. But you see people that they're there. They're saying like, okay, well, I'm going to show this person I got $50 million. They just gonna start uploading a ton of things that they don't need to upload, but, mm -hmm. but, they, but they want to prove it, I guess. Um, but but yeah, I, you know, I, I think it makes the process a little bit safer. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also kind of take the issuer out of it, right? When you've got an angry investor um you know sometimes we can take that blame you know we can go in there and say yeah you know what it's not their fault you know they're doing this so that everybody has a way to invest this is how you heard about it and you're, you're able to invest but you know they kind of have to go through this process yeah. and it's annoying and it's believable because i'm out there publicly actually kind of saying like this law is not fantastic i'm not sure that it really protects anybody right like the founder of this company verifyinvestor.com is promulgating 
kind of uh, policy that would effectively like harm verifyinvestor.com, right? Like, you know, as a person, I, I really identify with the investors. Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, so now I know, um, keeping up with the with the uh, entrepreneurial endeavors, I know that you're uh, also involved with different projects. So Prime Trust, uh, Infinity Ventures, Crypto. Um, tell us about maybe some more of the projects that you're working on. Yeah, you know, um, Prime Trust is a a company I sit on the board of. Uh, I think they're very, very interesting. What they do is they provide uh, infrastructure. Um, tools for other companies to build on top of. So they have a series of APIs that, you know, do like fiat on ramps, you know, like ACH wire, custody, custody escrow, uh, a, a whole bunch of things where traditionally, um, if you went into like a trust company and you need certain services, it'd be like call, call same thing, right? Call, email, yeah. uh, send documentation, sign, customize agreement. And, and then no API, so everything's manual, right? So Prime Trust is there to say like, well, let's give people some uh, a set of APIs so that they can mix and match them and create whatever they want. And I'm, I'm very proud of Prime Trust because, you know, you know they, they've excelled in the crowdfunding space where they power a lot of crowdfunding. Uh, they've also excelled in crypto where they power a lot of crypto platforms. Oh, that's great. And it, it sounds like it's kind of falling in line with what you like to do, by the way. So improving processes, making the making the workflow easier for individuals. And I and and then also I'm sure your guidance and what you did with verifyinvestor.com, one of the reasons why they, they picked you for the board for this one, right? <laughs> like it, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, Prime Trust had a product uh, called Fund America um, and it had done a lot of crowdfunding. And because mm -hmm. Verify Investor and Fund America were crowdfunding. And respectively, we were the two giants in the space, right? If you were looking for crowdfunding uh, escrow software or platform, um, you know, back end, you, you use Fund America from Prime Trust, um, you know, that product. And these days, it's just called Prime Trust, right? Uh, and if you need verification, you do uh, verify investors. So we already had that close relationship. Mm -hmm. So when, when, you know, when they were doing Prime Trust, um, they thought like, hey, you know, why don't you come join our board mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was happy to, you know. Infinity Ventures Crypto. Tell us more about that one. This is interesting because um, I'm just an advisor at Infinity Ventures Crypto, but I'm very passionate about this because it's doing what I really love to do. Infinity Ventures Crypto is an Asia-based uh, crypto VC. They invest in early stage uh, companies in the blockchain space, in the crypto space, typically focusing on like gaming, Web3, DeFi, things like that, right? Uh, things where... Uh, there's a token economy um, that uh, that could be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. So, I love building product. Uh, I'm not so I'm not so great on investment committees and, and things like that, but I love building product, right? So now you've got Infinity Ventures Crypto, and they're out there investing in you know hundreds of companies, and all those companies need a little bit of help, a little bit of guidance, and uh, tweaking of the product and things like that. So I'm there as a resource to Infinity Ventures Crypto for their own strategic needs, but also for their portfolio companies for their strategic needs. So I get to kind of go into the portfolio company and see like, what are you building? How are you building it? Oh, can we, can we build it better? What, what help do you need to go to market and things like that? Um, so to me, um, you know, it, it, it's a fascinating um, uh, role. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have to ask, Joe. I know I know you're a busy guy. A lot going on. I mean, uh, what's next? I mean, uh, other other ventures, other other products. Like like, what's next for you? Um, you know, I I I'm involved with a few companies. You know, in in various spaces like legal auto automation. You know, camera video management software or remote health. You know, so I, you know, I just like helping companies build out a little bit. I'm hoping that some of them will exit. So. Um, so everyone can get a good win out of it. Um, um, but for me, I think, you know, right now I'm, I'm interested, you know, focusing a lot, you know, on, you know, one family and two, I think this infinity ventures crypto thing is pretty interesting to me. I'm going to spend a little bit uh, more time just kind of helping these companies. These entrepreneurs that are so smart. They're so brilliant. They're yeah. all smarter than me. Right. And they're doing things that are cutting edge that could really change the way um, the world is operating now, or it, it really challenge some of our norms, right? And they scare me because they're smart and they're willing to push an envelope and things like that. Um, 
and I'm just there for the ride, trying to like pull them back a little bit sometimes and say like, well, is that practical? Is that legal? And things like that. Um, <laughs> um, but it's it's amazing because, you know, I, I just am so impressed with how brilliant people are in, in that space. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to spending some more time kind of helping them with uh, advisory work. Uh, it's uh, it is inspiring, and I I mean I feel I have the privilege of getting to speak with many um, many really talented people like yourself who've come up with ideas, who've taken things to market, who've added a lot of value to the marketplace. And to me, it's just such a hopeful thing, like to see all this innovation around us and the pace of innovation and all the things that are happening. I mean, I feel like every single day I'm talking to, well, I know I am, to a, to some entrepreneur, whether they're you know young, just getting started, or further along in their career with maybe a certain certain amount of success under their belt, um, like all of these different things. I think like the mass and the equation of everyone really progressing together is just something that's taken us, uh, that, that's going to be beautiful to watch and just to continue um, to see it unfold and to see this innovation is just been, it's a privilege over here. And I hope that our audience uh, is enjoying it as well. Um, George, speaking of the audience, if somebody's watching this and they want to just connect with you or just follow your journey, just in general, I mean, what's the best way for people to do that? I think, you know, obviously, if you're interested in Verify Investor, get verifyinvestor.com, singular. Um, and on Twitter, I am Jor, J O R L Law, L A W. And on LinkedIn, I'm just Jor Law, J O R L A W. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And we'll put all that stuff in the show notes as well so that my audience can just uh, click on it and head right on over and uh, and check it out. And uh, Jor, really, it, it has been a pleasure having you on the show and getting to know more about you, your background, your entrepreneurial background. You're cornering the, uh, the, the lottery ticket market in third grade, I think it was, or fourth grade. I mean, just a, a wonderful uh, story and an and entrepreneur journey and just really happy to bring it to the audience. And uh, speaking of the audience, if this is your first time engaging with Mission Matters as a platform, just to let you know, we're all about bringing on entrepreneurs and experts experts and executives and having them share, like, why do they do what they do? Like, why do they go out into the marketplace and make sacrifices for the good of all? And why are they mission-based? Like, what mission is important to them and why does it matter? Like, these are the types of questions and the things and the content that we're into. Uh, if that excites you or motivates you in any way or inspires you, uh, we welcome you to hit that subscribe button because we have many more mission-based individuals coming up the line and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Jorah, really, uh, seriously, it has been a pleasure. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks, Adam. It's been fun.